Hi guys, I'd like to introduce you something that we have today called the D-Max Karambit. The uh, D-Max Karambit, that we call it, is basically keeping in line with the particular ring feature of the Karambit. It has the curvature that is one of the essences of the Karambit blade. But one of the advantages, or rather modifications we've done to it, is we've made it more like in line with a straight blade so that it can puncture on its motion. The minimalist view of this particular karambit is that it's flat, meaning because we wanted to design a true karambit type neck knife, meaning that it can be worn underneath your clothing, flat, where it does not impede the way you're carrying. It's a fixed blade on this particular motion. Upon the draw, it goes strictly straight into the bakal or what we call the ice pick grip of the karambit. At the same time, you can also have it on its inverted version of carry where it's this way, which I'll switch it over and when I draw in, I'm straight into the thrusting grip where you have the thumb placement for thrusting which keeps the thumb uh, elongated for thrusting and at the same time if I transfer my thumb here I've got the power slashes of the D-Max Karambit. So no moving parts? No moving parts. It's very light, it's overall Motion here, it's black for concealment in terms of those who don't like anything shiny. And it's also very comfortable and light, fits in the hand. It's got that beauty and traditional curvature and the sexiness of Max Venom. The beauty of a neck knife is that, number one, it doesn't require any kind of folding parts. Most neck knives are pretty much a fixed blade. Uh, neck knives are for people who like to carry it on their person because for a lot of reasons, concealment is easy, they don't have to reach in their pockets, maybe their pockets are full, it's something that they like to have around. Neck times have been around for a long time, a lot of people carry them, they find it comfortable to carry of its ease of concealment if they want to have it there. Some people, remember one of the things we talked about, people like to carry weapons, always like to check in, it's easier to do that rather than to drop their guard and they're constantly doing this. The advantage of that is concealment, ease of carry, Disadvantage is to be able to have the speed to pull it out. And a lot of times you have to have the manipulation of knowing how to draw your clothing. Where you can see it here, in this particular grip, thumb lock, pull down, go straight into this particular grip. If the blade is phasing away from this, then as I draw, it goes straight into a thrusting particular grip. And that's the advantage of having a neck knife. What are some of the disadvantages of traditional neck knives? I imagine that they're small. Um, a lot of them are small in size that by the time you have them in your hand, they actually might fall. Retention is a big thing with smaller knives. Uh, having a true ring taken from the Karambit idea, you have that retention on this particular grip that you open your hands, you don't lose your blade. In the traditional grip, I open my hands, I don't lose the blade either. So that's one of the nice things about having it. It's small enough to where it's very comfortable to carry. It's long enough you feel comfortable with the extension for a defensive knife or for everyday carry, for utility use, for thrusting and cutting. So now I'm going to show you how a neck knife is deployed using the D-Max Karambit. Of course, being a neck knife, it's not exposed, it's underneath your shirt. The most important thing is get the hand underneath the shirt. So your fanning hand can find many ways of being able to use your finger extraction, index finger or thumb extraction to get your hand underneath. Hand goes underneath. Exposed, here's the karambit. Finger can go down here, thumb locks in here. Simply tug downward and the knife comes out straight into this particular configuration where you can go direct action response in your attack. If the karambit is in this particular configuration where I have it worn, and I'll just do it for you guys, this way, and have it tucked in, the same idea. So with the flat Flat the side flat side, side out. facing outward, right? The blade facing outward this way. So what happens here is, once again, your fanning hand, you get your fingers, whichever ever finger you use, your index, your this finger or your index or your thumb, hand comes underneath. Now we're underneath, notice it is in this particular configuration. Thumb goes here, grip. Pinky can go in or you can do that later after it's deployed. Simply tuck down and you're right in this particular configuration. Pinky can sneak in. Now you have your retention for slashing, thrusting with the thumb here, or power cuts with this particular configuration there. If I power cut here, or I thrust, I have the extension of my thumb to make it like a fencer's grip.
let's have a closer look about where your thumb placement is for power slashes. For power slashes, if I have my thumb down here and the pressure is on where the cutting edge is, you can start to feel the pressure press against my thumb and you can feel it right down there. Now, if the pressure is to cut with a bladed edge, simply by putting my thumb there, now I've got the pressure cutting right behind that edge, so there's a lot of cutting, power cutting. Now, if I want to extend, meaning extending the blade, pushing it down here, extends my thumb to where it's in a comfortable position, much like you would in fencing. Because you are thrusting, you're not slashing. If you're slashing, then it slides up because now I'm using the edge for your power cutting. Kuya Chris here is working with Jesse, and what Chris is using is the jabbing part of the D-Max Karambit. And we'll slow it down and show the application of one particular feature, the puncturing feature from jabbing. So slow motion, let's slow down. So the first thing, if you notice what Chris is doing, so he's got the elongated length of the particular D-Max Karambit. Now these are the trainers, that's why you want a trainer, so you can do this. You think Jesse here would like to do it with a real knife? Nah. -uh. So, for safety, he what he's doing is see the Wally practice here of puncturing there. Another attack is another puncture there. He does a forehand puncture there, and basically he just passes it and punctures. So all he's doing here is just poke, 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 and poke. What Kui Chris here is doing is extending to puncture. At the same time, he's puncturing on a backhand here, or forehand puncture, or at the same time guiding. Now, any kind of guiding without any lacerations can be used by the curve here of the D-Max. If he wanted to lacerate, he would use the inside curve of the D-Max Karambit. In reality, what he's doing is pretty much going for limb destruction, which is very common in the Filipino martial arts. It's called defanging the snake. He's trying to be merciful simply by poking and just destroying the limbs. And then, of course, by the time it gets to the head, it's probably because the guy just kept on attacking. It's not like the initial attack, oh, you're done. No, he goes, you hit, are you gonna hit me again? And get me a third time, okay, we're done. All right, so what Kuya Anthony is gonna demonstrate is the non-lethal use of the D-Max Karambit. He's gonna be using a trainer, but at the same time, even if it was the real one, he's gonna hit with the areas that are not sharpened. So what he's doing from a haymaker, solar plexus with the ring feature of impact. He goes straight into the brachial artery, or brachial nerve to destroy. He takes a less sharpened back edge of this particular thing and then he just pops me with the ring again. Okay, so in motion, hip, bicep, and strike. Once again, stop motion, bicep, hip, and strike. One more time, stop motion, pin the bicep, and then strike. What he's using here is the ring feature of the Karambit. If he use this feature, I'm over, it's over with, I don't get to fight anymore. But if he just puncture me in there, the next piece he's gonna do is he's gonna knuckle down underneath my bicep and he's gonna guide it to the outside and then cut away, okay? So as an impact tool, this is stoppage right here and then he knuckle dust right in here, he comes out here, he can guide and then puncture to get away. So now that we've shown you the non-lethal, there is a way that some people will use this based on knife tactics as a lethal version. Warning, you use this this way, you go to jail, period, all right? Now you better have a good reason why you're using this. We're showing you the art of the motion here of blade and the blade culture. In the attack, I'm a super bad, not bad guy, full of drugs, and I continue the attack. The attack is entered with the length or point of the karambit into a slash into that, the guiding, lethal option, lethal option. All these motions done over here are all lethal ways of using the blade. It's not anything special we do, it's what's out there, it's on YouTube, it's what other people use, it's a blade culture. Understand that it's this way and create a way to defend against it. So what's happening here is that Jesse's guiding the blade and goes direct action right into that. So that distraction takes him off his game. He takes the low line into the high line, fills the gap with a slice, 
and a cut and a continued attack. Once again, as Anthony delivers a strike, Jesse goes straight for that and uh, continues fills the space in between and attacks. So constantly working with edge and impact. Edge meaning the blade for that, impact meaning this. Edge here, impact meaning this. This is impact and edge again. What it does is because you see if I just cut in here and I cut in here, I've only cut his limbs. If I happen to hit this, there's no guarantee that a cut over there is going to stop him. So I continue to cover up and make sure that he's off his game when I'm doing these attacks. It's a continuous attack because when he throws, that's going to go and that's going to go. Same thing is if I that that's going to go, that's go. He's going to kick. He can do any kind of grappling, any kind of position. He can strike. He can pull his own weapon away. But if I keep him off balance, then I can cut. A neck knife has to be comfortable that you're able to wear. It's not so big that, you know, here's my neck knife. It's small enough to where it's comfortable to carry, but long enough at the same time to be a neck knife that you can have good retention. Some neck knives are so small that actually, you know, you could lose the hold on those particular neck knives. So we wanted something that has meat to it, that has the retention of a karambit, that at the same time in any particular grip is easy to move around with, but at the same token, we're able to play with it as the essence of a karambit or a thrusting straight blade at the same moment. So it is a karambit. I mean, it, the, the curve isn't as... It's prominent. got the essence of a karambit. That karambit, once again, is a, is a uh, exotic blade from Southeast Asia, more indigenous, indigenous to Indonesia and Malaysia. The Filipinos have turned into a big blade of what you've seen today as a knife rather than a claw. But um, what you'll find in most karambits is, once again, the distinguishing feature, distinguishing feature is the ring for retention. Of course, because it's traditional, it's got that claw curve of most karambits. This has got the straight blade so it can thrust. With a curved thing, if it's curved this way, I can't thrust this way. I'll have to come in from this particular angle. With this one, I can still do on a backhand angle and still be able to lacerate and at the same time puncture with this particular design.